Hey everybody, welcome into another message from Journey Church in Westerville. I'm Pastor Chris, and I'm so glad that you have jumped into this message today. You're going to be encouraged by it. We are in week number five of our series on discipleship, uh, but I want you to know all of these messages stand on their own. So if today's is the first message you've seen in this series, stay with it. You're going to get something great out of today's message uh, after the conclusion, if you want to see other messages in this series or any other uh, that we've done, they're all available through our website. Our website is journeywesterville.org. That's journeywesterville.org. You'll find links there to our Rumble channel, our YouTube channel, our Facebook page. All of these contain all of our teaching. Uh, this message, uh, this series on discipleship is going to be on our website front and center for a little while. There's a discussion guide, a, a uh, study guide. Uh, rather that goes with it so you may want to get that as well all of these resources are available at no cost um, and journey just wants to encourage you to grow in god's word i'm always teaching through it it's what i love to do today our passage uh, is in luke chapter 10 verses 1 through 16 you can see my outline on the screen the situation the execution and the response you know one thing i love about the gospel of luke is uh, the writer, uh, Luke, he also wrote the book of Acts in the New Testament. He uh, has been very faithful to uh, talk to everybody involved, firsthand accounts, interview them, and, and take a, a full accounting of the situation and, and write it down for us. Uh, as we go through the Gospel of Luke, we can see the process of discipleship that Jesus used with the disciples. It's laid out in an order uh, that we can really see this. Now, as I said, this young man would have been too young to walk with Jesus. Uh, he's not the Apostle Luke. He's a young man Luke, but he had trained as a doctor. He was very intelligent. And and the first half of Acts is all from Peter's perspective. So we know Luke spent time with Peter in the church there. And, and the second half of Acts is all written from the ministry perspective of Paul in the field, in the new church. Uh, this young man Luke not only recorded uh, the discipleship strategy of Jesus, how the disciples walked with him, what they learned from him. But he also uh, talked about the new church, the, 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 under the new covenant, and, and the church we have today. He covered these things extensively. And I'm thankful that the Lord utilized him in such a powerful way. We just finished before this series, uh, going through 2 Timothy. And at the end of 2 Timothy, Paul is waiting in prison to die to give his life for the Lord and, and to be martyred. And, and he says that Luke is with him. Uh, what a special man Luke was to follow the Lord so closely. And, and Luke doesn't just cut to the end and tell us uh, about the resurrection of Christ. He tells us about the earthly ministry of Christ. And, you know, that's really our key to discipleship. Understanding how Jesus taught the disciples uh, shows us how Jesus teaches us now. And as we started this process of discipleship, we started in chapter 5 of Luke, where Jesus calls the disciples, after a year of kind of half-heartedly following him, he calls them to full-time ministry, and they leave their fish, they leave their boats, they leave everything to follow him. Then we moved on uh, in, in our second message on discipleship uh, to talk about how Jesus taught them. In chapter 6, Jesus is giving the Beatitudes, he's telling them, listen, uh, you don't need to follow the blind. You need to follow somebody with sight. And Jesus was the one who had sight. He has perfect sight and pure sight. He sees all the dangers ahead. And we need to lay a firm foundation in Christ. Well, that led us to, to chapter 8, uh, to the disciples going across in, in a storm appearing. They woke Jesus up, matter of fact, kind of in, in, saying to him, listen, we're in danger and you don't care. But Jesus' protection worked. He got up, he told the storm to stop, and then he asked them why they didn't have more faith in him. You know, it's not the uh, act of having faith that matters. It's who you put your faith in. And Jesus wanted to make sure that they realized that he is our protection, that he always cares, that he is with us even when we're scared. Going in his direction where he calls us to go doesn't mean nothing battle ever happen. The disciples had been told to cross the lake, and as they were doing it, a storm came up. You know, sometimes 
Christians, well-meaning Christians, think, well, God must not want me to do something because it's hard. Sometimes he calls us to go through hard things so we can build our faith in him. His call, his teaching, his protection in the storm, but that wasn't enough. Last week, uh, we looked at his power, uh, the power for Jesus to do what only he can do. He sends a demon out of a, a man's son, and he gives that son back to his father. The father says, this is my one and only son. You know, Jesus could save this one and only son, but he's not going to save himself because he knows what he must do to bring us salvation. Jesus is all about salvation. His power saves. The disciples couldn't save, but they could tell people about the life-saving power of Jesus. Well, all of those things bring us to today Jesus' mission. Jesus was on mission. He's At this point in Luke, in Luke chapter 10, he's said, I'm going to Jerusalem. He is headed there, and we know why he's going there, and we know when he has to get there. He has to get there at the Passover because that's when the Lamb is slain for the people. That's when Jesus must be slain for the people. At Passover, Jesus knows that he must go, and that it's more than symbolism. He is the final Lamb, and he must complete what he has come to do. His mission is in full swing. And, and, and as Jesus goes through the rest of chapter 9, he, he saves this son, returns him to the Father, and then he continues. And at the end of uh, chapter 9, there are three different men that come to him and say, I'm going to follow you, and, but first I've got to go home. First I've got to uh, bury my father. First I've got to. And, and Jesus tells each one of them, there's no time. Why? Because there really was no time. Jesus had to go. He had a, a date. He had a time. He had a mission. And when you have a mission, you get focused. I don't know about you, but sometimes my wife realizes when I'm on a mission and, and she'll just let me tear into it. She'll give me that space and time I need because she knows once I, I get on to something, I, I'm going to want to see it through. The, the beautiful thing about the Lord's mission and his mission brief here is that it includes us. Uh, in this passage as I read, it's going to be 70 nameless people. Now the disciples may have been in this mix, and they probably were. The 12 had been sent out before. We know their names. But, but these who are sent out, we don't know them. But I can tell you, Luke records, as he talked to the disciples, the mission briefing, and he gives it to us. And I think it's worth us looking at, because if we're disciples, if, if, if we've heard God's call, if we've started to follow his teaching, if we've look to him for protection in storms as he sends us, as if, if we've witnessed his power to save, then we need to, to be on mission. We need to keep pushing forward. We need this passage. So let me read it. I'll come back, talk through the, the three things on the screen. Maybe you'll hear these three words. The situation that Jesus lays out, he knows what it is. He can see it plainly. The execution of of this project uh, that he wants done, of his mission, and how you're going to handle the mission response. Luke 10, 1 through 16. After these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to go. Then Jesus said to him, The harvest is truly great, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray for the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go your way. Behold, I send you out as lambs among wolves. Carry neither money bag, knapsack, or sandals, and greet no one along the road. But whatever house you enter, first say, Peace to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest on it. If not, it will return to you. And remain in the same house, eating and drinking such things as they give, for the laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not go from house to house. Whatever city you enter and they receive you, eat such things as are set before you, and heal the sick there, and say to them, The kingdom of God has come near you. But whatever city you enter, and they do not receive you, go out into its streets and say, The very dust of your city, which clings to us, we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near you. But I say to you, that it will be more tolerable on that day for Sodom than for that city. Woe to you, Chorazin and Bethsaida, 
For if the mighty works which are done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes, but it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven, will be brought down to Hades. He who hears you hears me, and he who rejects you rejects me. And he who rejects me rejects him who sent me. <laughs> so powerful mission briefing. Jesus is heading to Jerusalem, and he's going to be dispatching these 70s into towns ahead of him to kind of get things ready, a prep team to say that Jesus is coming and get the crowds out so everybody can begin to bear witness to the lamb that is going to the slaughter, the one who is going to be slain for their sins, the perfect one, the pure one, the loving one, the healing one, the powerful one, the praying one, the one who speaks for the Lord, the Messiah of Israel that they had looked for for hundreds of years. He's come. And as he gets ready to go, he sends out these 70. Now, as I said, uh, there aren't names here. It doesn't mean they don't matter to the Lord. It means that sometimes you can feel nameless to the world, but our job is always to tell people about how great the Lord is. Some of the greatest servants I've ever met over the years have been people that you wouldn't know their names, but they meant everything to me. They're famous to me. They're famous to the Lord. This old world wouldn't know them because they didn't have money and power in the way the world sees value. Much more than 12, much more than being nameless. These 70 went ahead of Jesus as he was hurrying to Jerusalem. There was a, a time gap. You know, the, those, those men at the end of chapter 9 that, that, that said they wanted to go but had something to do, there was no time for that. Jesus knew where he was going and what he was doing, and his mission was right now. They were to go ahead of the Lord. And, and I love in this first three verses, it says that, that, that the problem isn't that there aren't enough lost people. The problem is there aren't enough laborers to go and tell them the light has come. The harvest is great. But you can't bring in that harvest if there aren't more laborers. What these 70 were doing was vitally important. The world wouldn't understand that, but the Lord does. The Lord can see the lostness. And in our society, in America right now, there's a lot of lostness. There's a lot of kids growing up with no hope. There's a lot of people who, who don't know the Lord cares for them and, and truly who he is. The problem isn't people being lost. The problem is people working to talk about Jesus Christ and to put his great light on a stand for the world to see. Well, the, the first part of this is all about how things look. It's the situation. Jesus, as he told them before when he was telling them he was a good teacher, he can see. He's not the blind leading the blind. He's somebody who can see. He can see how much lostness there is in the world and how much the world's going to need what he's going to have to offer at the cross. And, and he needs more workers to go out and bring in more people. And as he sends them, verse 3 is chilling. He says, Go your way, behold, I send you out as lambs among wolves. This verse is, is amazing to me. A, a lamb is much weaker than a wolf. A lamb can be overtaken by a wolf. A lamb can be killed by a wolf. And Jesus isn't saying here, I want you to become wolves. I want you to become tougher. No, he's saying, I'm sending you out as lambs, as my lambs, as my sheep. And he's already shown that he it calls his sheep by name and they know him. He teaches them because he has vision. He is protecting them even when it's tough. And this is a tough mission. Some of these towns are Gentile towns and places where there aren't any Jewish people that would have that background. And, and, and this is going to be a tough mission. His power is going to have to be with them. But he doesn't want them to change from being sheep. You know, I have three quick examples of how this works. That people that didn't change from being sheep. You know, in Exodus chapter 3, uh, you may want to turn to this, you may want to make a note, but in 3.7, this is when, when the Lord comes to Moses in the burning bush. You may not know what Moses was doing out in the 
the desert out in the wilderness. He was tending his father-in-law's sheep. He had moved. He was out of the, the whole situation of captivity, living with his wife on the plains and his father-in-law, and he was a shepherd. And the Lord comes in the burning bush. Moses sees the bush isn't being consumed. He goes over and he takes off his sandals. It's holy ground. And the Lord says, I've heard my people. We're going to set them free. I'm going to set them free. And Moses said, oh, you're going to set them free from the Egyptians. And the Lord says, yeah, Moses, I'm using you. Verse 11 of Exodus 3, But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? Who was he? He was a shepherd. The miracles that happened weren't under his power. They were under the power of the Lord. He was under the Lord's leadership. The situation was Israel was locked up in slavery by the the most powerful army of the world at that time. And Moses, a man in the plain attending to sheep, was sent to free them. Was it going to really be Moses that did it? No. It was going to be the power of the Lord working through and with Moses. The situation was dire, and yet a shepherd was sent. You know, in 1 Samuel 17, there's a shepherd boy sent. This is David. And in 1 Samuel 17, 37 through 39, it says, Moreover, David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. So Saul clothed David with his armor. And he put on a bronze helmet on his head, and David uh, put on a coat of mail. He fastened his sword to his armor, and he tried to walk around. (laughs) He could not. And David said to Saul, I can't walk with these. I haven't tested them. So David took them off. David went out to face Goliath as a shepherd boy. Why? Because God had called him. How did this work? Uh, David even knows how it works. The Lord delivered him, and the Lord was going to deliver him again. It wasn't David's power. It wasn't his might. It wasn't the king's armor. He had to shed all of that because he was a lamb. And God's power was going to be the power that was evident. You know, well, one more thing I want to read to you, and this is the story of Gideon in Judges chapter 7. Uh, Gideon was hiding in a wine press to make bread because they're the enemies of Israel uh, came and, and, and stole everything from them anytime they were doing anything. Gideon wasn't necessarily a brave man hiding in this wine press to, to, to thresh wheat, to get grain for bread. But the Lord comes to him, and in Judges 7, 2, and 3, uh, chapter 7, verses 2 and 3, it says, And the Lord said to Gideon, The people who are with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands. Let Israel claim glory for itself against me, saying, My own own hand has saved me. Now therefore proclaim in the hearing of the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and afraid, let him turn and depart at once from Mount Gilead. And 22,000 of the people returned, and 10,000 remained. You know, the Lord said, Gideon, Israel's going to take credit for this victory. So I'm going to send one-third of your army home. Now, the Lord's going to even reduce the army down smaller, but his whole point is, listen, The people who are with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel claim glory for itself, saying to me, uh, my own hand has saved me. The Lord wanted Israel to be so weak that it had to credit the Lord for the victory. Moses wasn't sent because he was strong and fantastic. He was sent because the, the goal was to send somebody so weak as a shepherd that God would shine through. David, it wasn't his greatness as a man that propelled him. It was his dependence on the Lord and trusting in him that he would go as a little shepherd boy. Because what made him great on the battlefield was that he was trusting the Lord to save him because anybody could look at him and know that he wasn't going to be salvageable unless the Lord was with him. These 70 that are being sent there sent as lambs among wolves. Why are they sent that way? Because that's the way God always sends. That's the way he sent Moses. That's the way he sent Gideon. That's the way he sent David. He sent them as lambs. And he didn't want David to wear the king's armor. He wanted him to go as he was, depending on the Lord, because the Lord can triumph. And when Jesus sends out these 70, he's sending them out as lambs because he wants the Lord to triumph through them. He wants them to learn to depend on the Lord. And and, and those 
Uh, that's the situation. That's the sit rep. He, he's looking out and he can see he's a man of great sight. Jesus can see everything. The second thing in, in the following verses here, in, in verses 4 through 9, he gives the execution. How they should carry out the plan. The rules for the road, if you will. He says, carry neither money bag, knapsack, or sandals. <laughs> Why would Jesus say this? He's saying, carry, go light. Go light. Go right now. As I said earlier, there's no time. Jesus is headed to Jerusalem for an important date. He can't get hung up. They can't get up. Get hung up. If they're going to go ahead of him, they have to go now. They can't go home and pack up a bunch of stuff. They have to learn to rely on him, and they have to travel light. When you travel light, you can travel fast. He wants them to head out. If you've ever been backpacking, you know that the more you have, the slower you're going to go. Travel light. This is the execution for them. And then it says, and greet no one along the road. Now, why wouldn't you want him to greet people along the road? Again, you're staying focused. You've got to travel light, number one. You've got to stay focused, number two, to get there. You've got to go. You've got to go. Third thing, verse five. But whatever house you enter, say first peace to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest on it. If not, it will return to you. Uh, this is about speaking peace. God's kingdom is a kingdom of peace. He doesn't want people to, to go into homes that don't want you there are going to be argumentative or you're just shoving your way in the door, but a, a home that has peaceful occupants where you can really minister and make a base of operation. you got to travel light. you got to stay focused so you get to the home. And now the third thing is you've got to be peaceful and you've got to find a, a home that's not stirring up peace in a place of high drama, a, a place of peace. Verse 7, and remain in the same house, eating and drinking such things as they give, for the labor is worthy of his wages. Do not go from house to house. Whatever you sit, you enter, and they receive you. Each such things is set before you. Don't fuss about meals, and don't go from house to house. You'll look like a leech. <laughs> Find a house of peace that welcomes you, that you can make a base of operation, and don't keep trying to trade up either. Listen, when I was a kid, uh, when I was in college, I was in the college choir, and we were going on choir tours. And I remember one time we were on a, at a house. Different, all of us would get separated out, and, and we'd be, you know, housed by different folks in the church. And I was at a house with a a, a lady who was very, very old, and she made us sandwiches. Sometimes for the next day, they would ask the host families to to make us a, a pack lunch, and uh, she made us sandwiches, and she buttered that bread on that for that sandwich. Now I grew up with buttered sandwich bread but uh, but my friend who was in the house with me had never seen anything like that my grandma would do that and at lunch he started to freak out and started just talking to somebody else and said oh i hope we have a better house tomorrow can we switch with you stay where you are find a base of operation to eat their food be pleasant with them and get the work done don't look like a leech moving from place to place for your own pleasure don't try to rally up to a, maybe a home that has a pool. You know, sometimes on those tours, we'd hear from other people in our group that their home, you know, had a pool and they swam or they do all these different things. And listen, you don't want to compare. You're there to do a job, not for your own benefit. Uh, the thing here I would say is be content. Travel light. Stay focused. Don't get distracted on the road. Speak peace. Find a house of peace and not a place of drama. Stay there. Be content. Settle in to do your mission. It's not about your personal comfort during this time. And then the last thing, verse 9, and heal the sick there and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near you. You know, heal and, pre and preach. They've got to preach that the kingdom of God is coming, that Jesus is coming. And those healings, whatever happens, that's showing that, that the Lord is coming near. The Lord is coming near, so get ready. Get out in the streets, and, and you've got to preach. You've got to preach. You've got to encourage the sick to come out to hear the word of God. Pull them together. Help them to get there. These five things are the rules of the road. This is how you're going to execute the mission. You're going to travel light. You're going to stay focused. You're going to speak peace and not get distracted in arguments and homes. You're going to be content in the home you're in and stay focused on the work ahead, not looking out for your own personal pleasure. And you're going to preach and heal the word of God because that's what you were sent to do.
That's the list. And now we're down to the response. You know, everything at the beginning of this is important. You, you've got to look at the situation. You've got to stay a lamb. You're not called to be a wolf or to be evil or to be twisted or go in and manipulate people. You're not called for that. You're called to trust in the Lord, and, and that's the kind of person the Lord always sends, somebody who is going to depend on him because they know they're too small for the task. They're going to be too small for the task, but that doesn't mean they shouldn't be serious about being ready for the task, focused on the task, quickly to the task. Contend in the task. But the response is up to the people in the cities when you get there. And and in uh, 10 and 11, Jesus talked to them directly about how to deal with the response. But whatever city you enter and they do not receive you, go out into its streets and say, the very dust of your city which clings to us, we wipe off our feet against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near you. But I say to you, that it will be more tolerable on that day for Sodom than for this city. Listen, people had heard about Sodom. Even the general population had known. Even the Gentile had heard. And and here, the into the streets, the, the Greek here, it's really the main street. Go out into the main thoroughfare and let everybody in town know that if, if they're rejecting you, rejecting what you're saying about Christ, that you're not even taking the dust of their city. You're wiping it off. This was something Jewish uh, travelers would do if they happened through a Gentile area. They would uh, take off even the dust from their sandals because they didn't want even the dust from, from that Gentile area coming into the presence of their camp. This is a, a, a way to say to people, you're not worthy to have what I have. You're not worthy to enter into the presence because you've rejected it. You've done this. Sodom was opposed to the Lord and rejected him. Eventually they paid a price. People need to know if they reject the Lord, there is a terrible price for it. This doesn't mean this is honest. In this final passage, too, under response in 10 and 11, Jesus is making the point that the, the way they treat the ambassador of a nation is the way how they feel about that nation. If they don't want the kingdom of God, they're going to reject the ambassadors of the kingdom of God as well. Christians, we live in a world that sometimes reviles us and is mean to us and is nasty to us. And if people don't want to hear it, you move on to the next person you can share Christ with. Sometimes we want to keep sharing Christ to somebody who keeps hating us. Listen, if they've had their opportunity, maybe it's time to move on and and they have to deal with the response. Uh, Jesus, interestingly enough, expands this response in 13 through 16. <laughs> he goes on, I think, what we'd call sometimes a mini rant. It's not a rant. It's, it's, it's proper and appropriate because everything Jesus did was proper and appropriate. He says, wrote, Woe to you, Chorazin, woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works that were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. Now, I need to point out, the, the Chorazin and Bethsaida are, are towns that, that God's people, the Jewish people, would have inhabited. Tyre and Sidon were out, outside of that area. They were in Gentile area. And he's saying, listen, if, if they would have seen me, if they would have seen the amazing power that I have and the ability to save that I have, they would have, uh, Tyre and Sidon would have come along. But Chorazin and Bethsaida, you, you didn't. It's interesting. If you look through Scripture, you're not going to find much of what Jesus did in Chorazin and Bethsaida. But uh, John talks about this in his gospel that Jesus did so many things that many of those things don't even appear in Scripture. There would be larger and larger volumes written if all the things that Jesus did were written down. What was written down was what is important. And what is important for us to know is that Jesus came to his own and they rejected him. And they alone pay the price for the rejection of Jesus. The Gentiles were giving a blessing, in a sense, when Israel rejects. Here, you get into the the dishonest saint and the honest sinner. Who would you rather be? One thing I have the utmost respect for Paul on, when Jesus came to him on the road to Damascus, uh, Paul never, never again denied Christ. When he had seen him, when he honestly uh, heard his call, when he honestly was told what to do, he followed because he, he 
did what he did always, believing he was correct. He was not a dishonest man. In this passage, Jesus is really calling those who saw him the most closely dishonest for rejecting him. And he's saying, listen, there are some honest sinners that didn't see. They would have seen, they would have repented. Why did he go to his people? Because that was God's call for his people first. It only brings more judgment upon them when they reject. And Jesus says in 14, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. You know, one of the realities is sometimes we want people to be judged more quickly. And as we've been going through Luke, there is a, a spot where a city rejects Jesus and the disciples say, should fire and brimstone, should we call it down? And Jesus says, no. And Jesus isn't calling for fire and brimstone to fall down and destroy these cities like Sodom. He's saying no. But he's saying one day in the judgment, everything will be set right. His home base had been Capernaum. And in verse 15, it says, You, Capernaum, who are exalted in heaven, will be brought down to Hades. He who hears you, hears me, and he who rejects you, rejects me, and he who rejects me, rejects the one who sent me. If you reject the Lord and you reject his son, you will find no comfort, no peace with him. It, the response needs to be on the responder. You know, Christians worry too much about the response that we don't just share the good news. We don't go out and trust in the Lord and do these things that we're asked to do. He's not telling us to become wolves. He's not telling us that we got to conquer the prey. He's not telling us to drag somebody in. He's telling us that we need to be peaceful and loving like lambs. And, and we need to be sent out by our shepherd to share how good our shepherd is. And if the wolves want to reject us, we, we let them reject, but we don't get eaten by them. We move forward because the power of the Lord can sustain us and protect us. The, this was probably a dangerous mission. But the disciples have already been shown that the Lord can protect you if you're following him through a storm. And what is the storm? The storm here may be the rejection. And Jesus felt it more than anyone. He came to his own and they didn't accept him. They rejected him. He chose the Jewish cities to, to show his great work. He, he chose the area of Capernaum to, to, to show his glory. If you reject it and you've been shown it, it's in a tough place. You've rejected the Lord. You know, this whole passage is about one thing. It's about responding to Jesus. It's about responding to the messenger of Jesus. You know, do you have somebody in your life who shared with you about Christ and you've never let them know how much it meant to you, how much it helped you, how much it encouraged you? Maybe today you need to, to realize that person's probably faced a lot of rejection if they're sharing about the Lord and you can encourage them. Maybe for you, you don't share about the Lord because you don't want to face rejection. Maybe today you're okay with rejection because it's not you. They're rejecting the Lord. I've had people tell me terrible things about me or my family uh, saying that, that, and they believe, well, Christians are just like this. They don't know me. They don't know how I conduct my, my life. They don't know how much I love my wife and, and, and my children. They just pay me in a certain way because I'm one of those Christians, one of those followers of Christ. The response ha has risk and concerns along with it. But this whole passage is about seeing and responding to Jesus. Because the situation is... He needs more workers because there's a lot of darkness. And, and your job isn't to be great, it's to stay a sheep. And, and by the way, the execution is tough, but it needs to happen. And the response may upset you, but it may also delight you. Maybe that person you think is so close is actually very far away. And maybe that person who's very far away, who's never had anything to do with the Lord, when you share your faith with that person, when you preach and tell them the kingdom of God has come and the, the Savior Christ Jesus, you tell them what Jesus did for them on the cross, maybe that person far away is the one who can be saved. I'm going to tell you something. It's not about being close and growing up in the church or it, it's in getting incrementally closer. It's about hearing the word and responding to it. These 70, I don't know how much they know. Jesus gave them some basic training here and in their mission brief, and he sent them out to do a very difficult task with very little training. But what they really needed was faith. They needed to see and respond to Jesus right away, and they did. Let me close on this. Has Jesus ever asked you to do something and you put him off? 
Maybe you need to see and respond. Maybe you need to ask Jesus if you've uh, tried to be a wolf. How you can be a sheep and depend on him and see his glory. We need to see and respond and respond quickly. We need to do it appropriately. We need to take off all the other armor, all the other stuff. And let Jesus ring true. His kingdom has come. Our Savior is here. He's here and he's coming. Let's get the word out. Let's go sheep. Let's spread out and share. Our Savior is good. And he's given for us. Both those far and those near need to rejoice in Christ and Christ alone. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you would help us to stay true to being your sheep. Help us not to put on the clothing of the world, the money, the riches, the power, all the things that the world tempts us with, those won't bring people to salvation. Our dependence on you, Father, our need for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the grace and and, and power that comes only through knowing you, that's what our world needs to hear. The truth of your peaceful kingdom, not the drama of this world. Father, I pray that you would help us to travel light and to stay focused on your word. Help us not to lump all kinds of other things in because what matters isn't my seminary, isn't my Bible degree, isn't all those other things. What matters is that I truly love the Lord every day, that I'm your sheep, that I'm on mission for you. Father, help us. Help us to be simple in all the ways we need to be simple to share the faith wholly trusting on you and you alone for any strength and any knowledge we might have so that we can say we come in the name of the Lord and it can be so. Help us and guide us in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, my friends, that's all I had. If I had more, I would share it with you. Uh, we have our church picnic on August the 13th. If you're watching it before this before August 13th, 2023, you can come out to that. Um, next week is our week number six, our final week. Uh, I hope that you're enjoying this series. Let me know. Uh, I'd love to hear from you again. Check our website for all the messages in this series and all the details. And I hope to see you soon.